Uh, David Larwood is coming on back up to share a little bit about a project that they've been working on for quite some time that actually has touched my family and many families across the state of Arizona. Um, David's going to talk to us about his company, Valley Fever Solutions. Thank you, David. Thank you again, Joan. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, my family has been involved in healthcare in Arizona continuously for over 60 years. Uh, in the middle 50s, uh, my father's uncle moved to, uh, take, to run Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, his wife ran the, was the original dean of the nursing school at Arizona State, ran that for 10 years and was continually in, involved, not, not, a, not a high impact for 60 years, but, but they were there. And I've been doing this for seven years. I also worked for a Phoenix firm for uh, several years in the late 80s, uh, so I spent a lot of time in Phoenix. But I live in California, so I spend, I spend time uh, back and forth between these two uh, places. So we're bringing new hope to an orphan disease. Joan asked me to talk about a couple of things. Uh, so I'm, I want to talk about my disease and my, uh, my project, but I also want to talk about orphan diseases generally. So it turns out that, you know, for all these reasons that we talked about today, it's hard to raise money for these things. The, four talks, the three talks you've just heard and mine, these involve millions and millions of dollars. You just can't do this. It's not like a software project. It's, it's beyond the scope of angels. Angels can get you a little bit started, but really moving forward with something takes just huge amounts of money. The NIH has been very kind to us, fortunately. I saw a notice that um, Kevin McCarthy uh, was elected as the majority uh, leader in the House. Uh, this is very good news for us because when he was the leader, when he was a majority whip, he organized a conference in Bakersfield, where my parents still live, uh, on Valley Fever. And uh, he brought together the head of the NIH, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, I'm sorry, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, Tom Frieden, the head of the CDC, uh, were panelists, and I got to meet these people and hang out with them a little bit. He brought David Schweiker from this district, and he, of course, was uh, from the Bakersfield district. There's a lot of people interested in Valley Fever. Now, that doesn't give us direct funding. Actually, it's interesting, my, uh, my largest competitor for, um, for funding is my mother. Because my mother was a, a politician in California and raised $15 million to do vaccine research. But it's hard to do that for therapeutics uh, for, for lots of reasons. So what is valley fever? So valley fever is an orphan disease. An orphan disease, uh, you know this, is, uh, uh, impacts less than 200,000 Americans uh, in any given year. Valley fever, not unlike polio, about 60% are asymptomatic, completely asymptomatic. About 30% have some level of symptoms. 150 people die every year from valley fever. Uh, and about 1,000 people, new people each year, have to take drugs basically for life. Uh, the best available drugs aren't good enough. So what we're bringing to this situation is a new drug that, that we hope will be helpful. Oh, gosh, the angle's pretty tough here, OK. Uh, so it turns out that 60% of the cases are, uh, that are, the known cases are right here in, in central Arizona. 50% of them in the Phoenix area, 10% in the Tucson area. That's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that when we go, when we go to do a clinical trial and we're trying to find patients, we know where they are. Uh, 12,000 cases, 10 to, 10 to 12,000 cases a year are confirmed as diagnosed, uh, di confirmed diagnoses of valley fever every year right in the, just, just in Arizona. Um, a goodly number in California. So when we need to get to enroll patients for these small trials, we know where to find them. Um, da, 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 da. It also impacts pets. So uh, dogs, there's any number of cases where dogs get valley fever. Uh, the numbers are similar to humans. It's about 160,000 humans, about 180,000 dogs get sick each year. The percentages are pretty similar. Dogs tend to get a slightly more serious form of the disease. The disease starts, uh, well, in, there, in, this is a picture of the organism that grows in the soil. Uh, that's a microscopic picture. So these things are pretty small. They'll go through a painter's mask, but they won't go through a, a better respiratory filter. Um, and they get in people's lungs. So, we, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bash my microphone. Uh, sitting here in this room in the high season, if one of those little spores happened to float through, we would be at risk just being in, you know, breathing. Uh, so it's you know, pretty tough to ask people to stop breathing. Uh, the good news is putting things in perspective, the rate of infection is such that a lot of people live in Phoenix and people keep coming to Phoenix. People live in Bakersfield and keep coming to Bakersfield um, because it's, 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 it exists, but, um, but it's not devastating. But we still want to be able to take care of those people that, that we can. 
So uh, it's underdiagnosed. It presents as pneumonia. So the epidemiologists tell us that about a third of the people that have a coughing chest and feel terrible and tired uh, who go and see their doctor, about a third of them in this area have valley fever. If you were in Ohio, it would be a vanishingly small number. But about a third of them here. And so what that means is a lot of, and a lot of people are treated with antibiotics uh, because two-thirds of the cases are not fungal disease. Uh, but also in, the, in, the, in identifying whether somebody has valley fever, they look at those symptoms, they look for accumulation of, of fluids in the lung, uh, and then do a blood test. And the blood test is unfortunately not reliable. So one of the things that it gives a lot of false negatives. Um, the, Connor Jackson famously was misdiagnosed for months until they finally, until the, the, finally the test said, yes, that's what's what he has. So it's hard, it, there's challenges in diagnosing it, and there's people addressing that. Um, the people in, at NAU and TGN are coming up with some, some improved diagnostics. We have some idea for diagnostics, but that's another story. Uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, so what can we do? So we have, uh, the Air University of Arizona has the, uh, the document that says that an orphan product designation for our new compound uh, treated, treated against valley fever. I'm sorry, our new compound. Nicomycin Z was discovered in the 80s uh, by Bayer. It was developed by a company called Shaman Pharmaceutical in the 90s. Uh, they spent millions of dollars, uh, made the drug, tested it, did some preliminary studies, got through preclinical, uh, uh, made some drug for you know, a great expense, uh, started the clinical trials, and then the company failed. So for about seven years, the asset was sitting in boxes. The product, the drug product was in a refrigerator, well-maintained, and that ended up at the University of Arizona in 2005. Um, my background, I was a medicinal, chemistry, a medicinal, medicinal chemist at UC San Francisco. Um, went into law, went into business, was a VP at a couple of startup companies that were very successful, um, and the last one got sold. So I was looking for something to do just at the time they needed somebody to get involved in this. So I thought this would be great fun. I can use my medicinal chemistry again as well as my business experience. And so that's very exciting. But back to the orphan and raising money, it's still hard to raise money. We think the market is $200 million. Somebody else says, I think it's $50 million. I had a conversation with a VC early on. He said, $50 million with a good return, that's a good investment. But they still, will, nobody will write a check. It's hard to get people to write a check. So fortunately, the grants, the National Institutes of Health have been very helpful to us. Uh, and we, we've raised several million dollars from them on various grants and continue to raise uh, grant money to do support. We're just at the edge of making trial material to move into patients, which is a very exciting time. The pre, and the, the, uh, the preclinical results, turns out that for whatever reason, mice are a very good model. So all of the known drugs when given to mice show a, uh, the, the animals with valley fever show a response to the known drugs that's highly parallel to what you see in humans. Same is true for nicomycin, except in nicomycin it's a curative. So we're very excited about getting it into humans, but this remains a challenge. Nicomycin Z is a new class of antifungal. The, early fung the earliest drugs that were used were amphotericin, done in the 50s in the Bakersfield area by my father's partner, just to keep things very incestuous. Uh, my father's business partner, uh, uh, medical partner, um, uh, was in the, involved in the very early tests of amphotericin. Amphotericin is still used in various forms uh, for treating valley fever, for various serious forms of valley fever. In the 60s, a drug called ketoconazole was introduced uh, and actually approved by the FDA for valley fever. Uh, now, it turns out that ketoconazole has a lot of rather nasty side effects and is no longer used. It's, a, it's, it's still approved, but the side effects are such that nobody prescribes it. But other azoles, it's, ketoconazole is a triazole, and uh, other azoles were developed, and so now the standard of care is something called fluconazole. It's widely used, it's off patent, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, and there's other, some other fancy azoles that seem to give better performance and are, and are somewhat widely used. The good news for us with our new compound is that gives us a model. We talked about reimbursement. Who's going to pay for this thing and how much are they going to pay for it? When I go to the investors and I say, I think this is a $200 million market, they say, how do you know that? And so one of the things I can look to is what people are, are being given for drugs now and how much they're paying. But these are all pieces. You have to integrate all these pieces to tell the whole story. Uh, the nice thing about nicomycin is the nature, the mechanism of action is that it interferes with the formation of cell walls in insects and fungi. 
since we are neither of those, one would expect, and the tests suggest, that there's essentially no interaction of the drug with mammalian systems. So humans can take large quantities of this drug, and you can basically um, you know, put, put the, the disease organism in a soup of poison while not impacting the, the, the humans at all. So that's, uh, hopefully uh, that will pan out as we get to our, our uh, phase two trials coming soon. Uh, in terms of what will we do next, we are a one-trick pony. We have one compound for one indication. Uh, that goes in two directions. There are other fungi that we believe the nicomycin will be useful in. In fact, there's evidence that it will be useful in. So that expands the potential market. Uh, also, right now, the organism, the drug is made by a uh, fermentation process. It's very much like making streptomycin or erythromycin. You take a vat, put in some yeast, brew it. Uh, the product comes out. You have to purify it. Uh, but they could be made synthetically. Uh, and so once we're making it synthetically, then we have the opportunity to make analogs, look for higher activity, higher potency, different impacts, different side effects. Uh, so there's a whole family of projects we can do that way. So that's also part of our story. But that's downstream. We have to get, we, we, need, a million, we need $2 million to make trial material uh, to get to our free trial, but it's not, it's not there yet. So in the, uh, this has been touched on some, and I won't dwell on these slides, but for those who don't know the process of getting a drug, a, a, a drug candidate identified, first of all, you have, some, have to have some reason to think it's going to be effective in people. That's usually going to be in a Petri dish, maybe some animals. Then you're going to look at the toxicity. Is there a balance of potentially curative effects versus potentially harmful effects uh, for the safety profile? So does the drug actually work? And you look for endpoints. In our case, we're looking for resolution of symptoms. We're looking for the, uh, the lung clearing up. We're looking for the antibody titers to decrease uh, to a resting level. Those will be, be endpoints that will tell us that this thing is actually working. Um, there's a whole big issue around the FDA policy. Do you, FDA has, has had orphan uh, preference for orphans for quite a number of years. Where the, it's, it's not that the thresholds are lower, but you, have, you can use smaller populations. They may not ask you to do quite so many uh, it, test cases, in, in, and so they're, they're a little more tolerant of uh, trials and supportive. The Critical Path Institute has been very helpful to us. Ray Woolsey, ha who founded that, has been given, a, given us wonderful guidance on potential trial design. And the FDA supports that sort of thing. Uh, not mentioning these slides because it just came up a couple days ago is the GAIN Act. The GAIN Act was passed two years ago, and for um, molecules that are active against named organisms, uh, they get some preferential treatment. And we were just, uh, Valley Fever was added to that just uh, two weeks ago. So that's very exciting. So, um, questions. Is it the right drug? Is it going to do what's needed? Is it the right patient? And the personalized medicine is a very exciting place in medicine. Does the drug have the right safety? Right time is actually an interesting question. The pharmaceutical companies talk about how long will it be before we can sell this stuff. And uh, they like our path. They said a you know, couple years is, is perfectly fine. And reimbursement. It's been talked about a lot, but it has to be there and it has to work. Um, okay, pushing buttons. Um, the process is expensive, takes a long time. Uh, this has been talked about. And uh, our timeline, uh, we hope to, we're trying to make drug product. We can make drug product by early, about a year from now. Uh, there are some trials ready to go. With some luck, those trials will be productive within six months. We'll go to another trial, which we hope will be pivotal. It's, it's, it's certainly possible to design a pivotal trial. For those who don't know that, a pivotal trial is something that demonstrates enough uh, statistical relevance that it looks like it's going to be reasonable to go ahead and, and, and approve this thing and then move to the new drug application. So it's possible we could have this on the market in 2016. Some delay is more likely, but it's possible. Um, so um, planning for that, and we're looking for $5 million to do that. $2 million will make this pile of drug for us. If that's successful, then we went into $3 million to do uh, another clinical trial in addition to this free trial we get to do. And I think that's my last slide. Ah, oh, the team. Um, so I have chemistry and business background. Uh, John Galgiani is amazing. He is definitely, when you talk about key opinion leaders, he is revered in the world of, of uh, mycology, uh, study of fungi uh, on the national and the international level. So he's completely great. Bob Asenzo was at Critical Path Institute. He was a chief operating officer from the first days. He ran the Drug Industry Association, and that's after 30 years at Upjohn and Nova Nordisk. Um, and we have others who are very helpful. So it's a great place to be working. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Joan. Thank you all for having the, the, the patience to be here so late in the day.